a show-and-tell interview with the lovely Pat Southern Pierce. If you're new to Studio 56, welcome. Studio 56 hosts free demos and artist interviews like this one that you will find on our YouTube channel called Studio 56 for Creatives. We also produce online workshops for artists and we organize in-person vacation workshops for artists in gorgeous locations around the world. So welcome everyone. Let me tell you a little bit about Pat Southern Pierce. Pat is from the north of England. She trained as a painter and had a long career in teaching uh, in schools and at university before she stepped back to work for herself. She is known for her love of watercolor pencil on toned grounds. Pat has taught workshops around the world and is definitely a favorite at Urban Sketchers Symposiums. So welcome, Pat. Pat, can you come into the call? There, we are. there she is. Hi, Barry. Hi, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Little glyph there. Glip. <laughs> yeah, it's no problem. So um, our exciting news is that Pat is going to be teaching an in-person vacation workshop just for artists in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario, Canada, this September. We're, we're going to be sketching this charming town and we're going to visit a winery. We're going to Fort George and we're going to see Niagara Falls. We're going to take in a live play at the Shaw Festival and it's going to be super fun and you are invited. So you'll find more information about it at www.studio56boutique.com. You have to go to the pull down menu called Travel Workshops and look for Pat's name. So Pat, how are you today? You look gorgeous as always. Oh. You're a darling. <laughs> You're a darling, Brenda. I'm feeling good. I mean, I'm just about back home and over jet lag. So I'm starting to smile again. Yeah. And be, you, you're always so colorful. All the background is colored behind you and your your sweater is lovely and colorful. And so are all your sketches. <laughs> well, I my whole house is full of color. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. So um, we're really excited. Uh, you just got back from a, a two month trip to Australia, right? Yep, two months. Yeah. Yeah. And in that time, I, I saw your sketches. And I had this feeling like, she just got more colorful while she was away. Do you feel like you've you kind of uh, boosted your color, your saturation of colors? Uh, without question. Without question, Brenda. Yeah. Last time I went to Australia, the same thing happened, but it happened in a different way. I went for three months and halfway through the heat of Australia, the harsh light of Australia started to speak to me. And I realized that I was old. I was beginning to change my colors. And when I got back home, I started working in rainbow colors and dropping color into water on watercolor paper and playing now this time it's happened in a different way but again it was halfway through yeah and it suddenly dawned on me that actually i brought this sketchbook with me which is a handmade one a, a german friend uh, had made for me and i thought i'll take this with me because it's got a lot of my sketches in yeah. And I can show people, and it has some spare pages at the back. So I took it with me. Uh, that's one I've just finished today. Yeah. But the thing was, in at the back of this sketchbook, there were one or two pages that were purple and golden, and one of the double pages was a golden yellow. And suddenly I started working and drawing and everything changed it wasn't planned it just happened mm -hmm. and from that was when I was in still around Sydney and in a blazing hot day and I had to catch the heat yeah. on the paper and this grew and grew and grew from then I started hitting the art shops and buying uh, new colours and golds and yellows and reds and blues and uh, playing. Yeah. I was still teaching in browns and greys at my workshops initially because I'd asked everyone to bring those colours. But 
I was beginning to draw like that myself. And in my final workshop, I asked everybody to choose one of the pieces of colour I'd bought, wow. paper, and yeah. they all had a go on it. So, yes, definitely, it's changed. I'm sure they love that. Well, why don't we turn off our cameras, you and I, and then we'll uh, fill the screen with um, your sketches and we can talk about it more when we have the sketch in front. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. There we go. Let me just, there we go. Okay. So, um, so Pat, uh, this is, absolutely gorgeous absolutely <laughs> gorgeous i love it i love it with a passion i love it so much oh. i love everything about it i love the combination of colors i love that it's all just sort of off kilter slightly yeah um, yeah yeah and so um how how influenced are you by local color um because you know when you're using this kind of intense color obviously this church was not these colors but I mean how do you maybe I should rephrase the question so for people who are watching people like me how do you ignore how do you get past the local color and free yourself up to use this kind of it's saturated color and and and, and feel you know uh you know even think of it and just feel inspired to do it interesting question Brenda because you say how do I ignore and get past local color now, I took a photograph of this church and it really was like something out of a fairy tale. It had bright red brick, which was varied in tone, like mine is, and it had all these white turrets, just like something out of a child's fairy tale book. Oh. And the sky really was a bright blue. I think probably all I do is I use local colour and I look really closely at it to see variations within it, like I have in the bricks. If you look at the bricks at the bottom, some of them are yellow, some of them are gold. The um, pointed shape above the door is redder and you've got shadows, but it's not red everywhere, the same red. I've played with it. Up at the top near where the bell tower is, there was a shadow and some of the bricks are darker. So I've done them in a wine red. But basically, I haven't ignored local colour. I've used local colour, but I've probably heightened it. I've given it more of a glow because I love to see a glow on things that deserve it. And I always look for these um, textural differences and visual differences that make a surface more interesting, like all the brickwork and the pointiness. Now, the windows they were reflecting the sky. I may have actually left one or two little parts of them, like the points at the top. I may have done a whole one of those in blue that wasn't blue, but it was reflecting the sky. And something I do tend to do is if I have a colour in my hand, I'll say, where else can it go? Right. If you can, if you can balance a colour, in different parts of the picture, that can give unity and so much more interest. If Absolutely. you look at the, if you look at the bright um, slant of the sky, which is blue, you've got the blue in the windows, and in the other windows, the smaller ones, the bottom window, top left, and you've got it behind the trees, and in little gaps within the trees too. And if you notice, there's just a subtle touch of this blue in shadows by the gate on the right and as the path goes back behind and a little stroke of it on the trees at the back yes it's local color but it's heightened because yes. i look for colors within colors it's something i learned when i trained as a painter to see right. colors within colors yeah mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I know you, <laughs> I know that you've used a lot of different materials here. Um, can yes. you kind of give a sort of an overview of what kinds of materials you use to create? This I can. Sketch? Yes. Well, the bright blue of the sky is a Posca pen. I was given, you see the line around the building. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's an aqua green Posca. And I was gifted two of those in Delaware. 
uh, a year ago, and they've kept going. But since then, on my travels this time, I bought two more blues, a sky blue and a medium blue. Yeah. And I so find let's just go back for a second, because I know what? some people have their pens and papers out and they're writing down these materials. Because okay. right. for some people, they would never have heard of the brown, uh, sorry, the brand. And, and I know they're going to email me after and say, what was that <laughs> pen that she used? And okay. <laughs> Right. Well, so I've got Posca. Posca. I've got them, two of them here. Um, one of them is a uh, Posca Sky Blue, and it's a uh, one point eight to two point five millimeter bullet tip. So Posca is P O S C A. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and it's a liquid marker, acrylic liquid marker. Okay, that's the the blue one. And the turquoise one is actually called Aqua Green. And it's a PC5M. They both are PC5M bullet shaped 1.8 to 2.5 millimeters. I wouldn't be without those nowadays. And I find them really useful for titles as well. If you have a blue color in your picture, you can pick it up in the title and it helps to balance it. So Posca with a P, P-O-S-C-A, yep. P -O -S -C -A. is acrylic marker. Yep. Okay. Anything else? Um, well, all the reds that you can see in the building, in the church, they are a mixture of a Posca red. They only do one red. And different uh, colored pencils. I use Holbein colored pencils, which are a recent addition this last 18 months I think they're called Holbein H-O-L-B-E-I-N artists colored pencil they're not watercolor pencils but they are they have a bigger rounder lead colored lead they're much oh. bigger than normal pencils and very creamy yeah, I know you love the creamy and, and mm -hmm. as opposed to the waxy, the opposite of the waxy. Yes, they are very creamy and the Holbein do a particularly nice range of blues. They do, and I buy mine from Jackson's online and Jackson sell all over the world, not just in, in the UK. Yeah. And you can buy individually. If you buy a set of 12, I think that's a waste of time because you don't get the colors. I wouldn't get the colors I want. Mm -hmm. If you buy a pack of 72, which I used to do, I ended up using a third of them and two thirds didn't get used at all. But at Jackson's, they carry the full range of Holbein and Caran d'Ache Supra Color, which I also use. And you can hand pick your own. Yeah, perfect. Is there anything yeah. else? I, we, I want to move on to the next sketch, but is there anything else in this sketch? Like, what did you use for the white? The white is a, my trusty, it's a Mitsubishi Signo Uniball. And it's a lot, it's a broad one. Um, 153 white. Don't buy the thin ones because they are useless. They don't flow properly, but the broad ones are very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, honestly, this this sketch, um, this sketch uh, almost looks uh, like it was done uh, uh, digitally. Ah, that's because, Brenda, I started this on paper and we had to stop. So when I got back to the house, I imported it into Procreate on my iPad Pro. And that's when I added extra blue in the sky and heighten the white even more on the windows and so on. That was in Procreate. Wonderful. It's beautiful. All right. I don't want to, uh, uh, I don't want people to miss out on the sketch on the interview. So I want to move on to the next one. So um, the, this one is in that sketchbook you were talking about that had multicolors. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. This is, well, this was the quickest little sketch because I was, I went into an op shop, as you can see, and bought all serviettes and crocheted things, and I loved it. And I was being picked up in about 
10 minutes and I needed to sit in the shade and the people in the op shop actually brought me a chair out so that I could sit and draw really, really fast. And by right. the time I'd done that, I had to just scribble. Yeah. And it's and just a line drawing. Yeah. You're a fountain pen person, right? So all the black is fountain pen? All the black is fountain pen. And it is a, a feud pen, a Duke Confucius feud. And I was dipping into ink. And the white is the Mitsubishi white. And I really had to just go mad to get a remembering of being there. Mm -hmm. But it shows you can do something really simple mm -hmm. and it can work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. This one is just lovely, just lovely. And so you've, you, you, um, you really do mix media because you use the acrylic markers, the uh, watercolor pencil, you're using a Mitsubishi pen and you're using a fountain pen. So you really are, you know, pulling from out of your kit, like all kinds of different things. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, this was partway through my journeying around Tasmania. And this was, you can see a beautiful, beautiful church. And I sat with friend and host Patty Edge. We sat in the gateway of the church the churchyard facing this so that we could sit in the shade and draw. And this is what it was like. The stone on it is really so gentle. When you think about the red church gallery that we've just been looking at, this is a totally different, peaceful place. Mm -hmm. And again, on the yellow, I've used Holbein, very pale cream and white pencils. I've used, I stroked across the one of the Holbein pencils to give that quietness of blue. If you look on the horizon behind the trees, you see the hills in the distance. You could always see these hills in the distance in Tasmania. And as you look back, they are a definite blue. And if you heighten that blue behind, behind the trees and introduce it in the title and a little touch of stroking only in the windows and the door and the sky. Again, it's balanced. Mm -hmm. It's not just stripes of colour. Yeah. And you really, I mean, I've, I've uh, recently just realised how valuable it is to have a limited palette. And uh, oh. and you really do that because uh, it otherwise you have like a patchwork quilt of all these colors yes. all in place. Yeah. Um, and uh, this one really, you can see that it's really benefited by that a lot. Um, so uh, uh, Pecky is asking Pat, if you could please explain your step-by-step -step process. Do you work on negative space first? Um, let's see. Well, for this one, Negative space, the, the first thing I look for is the shape against the sky. If you half close your eyes, look at the, ignore the trees for a moment and just take your finger along the shape of the church and up to the top of the steeple and down and along. That is where I start. I get that shape against the sky and I work along. When I get to the trees, I would probably just go up to suggest where they are with an arc and down. Once I've got those, that shape in, then I can move. And then you're right. I could well then go for the negative shapes. I would look at the darks. I like to put darks in pretty soon because to me, they punctuate a sketch. I mean, you take the dark of those trees away. It's a different drawing altogether. But if right. you half close your eyes, Look at the shape of the trees. Look at the punctuation of the darks in the windows. Most of these windows are just plain black. But if you look at the one on the steeple, next to the, just above the door, there's just a suggestion there, isn't there, of the blue of pane glass. So you start with the blacks, but you can just lift them with blues as well. Beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. I love it. Thank you, Brenda. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> so that the paper is, I don't know where you find your paper. My goodness. Ah, uh, well, this was in Launceston. We had a tray, a trawl around various art shops and art stores in Launceston. Uh, this was in my waking up to colour time. And wow, this was hard. You can imagine looking at it, can't you? Yeah. It was much, much harder than I ever expected. Once I sat down, it actually took quite a while because the perspective yeah. is quite steep. And not just the building, but all the um, the broken up, the lines breaking it up on the building and the diamonds and the triangles. And, of course, they all go away in perspective too. And you've got the shadows. So there's a lot of looking in this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's so um, dramatic, really. Everything about it is dramatic. The colors, the perspective, it's incredible. <laughs> it's, and, uh, do it's you just, always outline in white, but, Pat? Uh, no, almost always, but not quite always. Sometimes I leave things alone and just let the sky do the talking, just right. occasionally. Sometimes I'll outline in a Posca pen in a turquoise or a blue yeah um, beautiful what i just want to add is one of the hard things about this apart from the drawing out of it is if you look at this face of it the left hand face look at all the different rectangles yeah and if i'd done all those the same it would have looked infinitely boring mm -hmm. but i had to like i do with skies and everything else i looked into each of these rectangles really carefully to see what was different about them and again heightened the colors to create these differences and these textural differences too gorgeous gorgeous if anybody has questions for pat you can type them in the q a box and uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can Oh my goodness, so beautiful. So sparkly, <laughs> really sparkly. <laughs> Very and, different. And you know, so different from the last one. So this one's so soft. Mm. Well, this was in the Blue Mountains, in Blackheath, up at the top of the Blue Mountains, in Alex Snellgrove's beautiful garden with giant agapanthus. And we'd been working indoors um, in her conservatory. And we came out into the garden and I did a demo. This was my demo to show everyone how you can draw trees and get an atmosphere very simply. And you can see, like with the building of the church, you can see again, there is the shape against the sky. Not as obvious this time, but it's the angle. I love to see an angle in in sketches you see this so often from me but this is going in the other direction but the angle of the dark shadow the trees coming up and then the sunlight filtering through and again another thing you'll see in my work often is the sky and um, color of the sky between trees i don't i don't color all the sky in and put the trees on top I draw the trees first and then the sky happens. And that way it's got a lot more energy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just beautiful. You are also really great about the strong light, dark contrast, which I think is really an important um, element in, in, in a good sketch. And Thank you. Yes. it's just lovely. So a question here from Pecky who says, uh, what is so interesting for me is Pat uses highlights very strategically Pat, when you look at a scene or a picture, what do you see first? It almost feels like you see highlights and you work backwards. I think you're probably right, actually. I see the shape against the sky. I see darks and lights. Those are what jump out at me. Yes, highlights and the atmosphere, the atmosphere of a place. I really have this need. To, to get the feeling of where I am down fairly soon. I don't draw it all out and colour it in. I start to draw and I feel it and it grows. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah. it starts from the dark and light you're right yes okay uh, it, uh, also uh, a couple other questions here i'm just going to move to the next uh sketch whoa <laughs> So dramatic. Um, and the next uh, question is, uh, Carol says, say hi to Pat, Pat from Carol in Hobart. It's three o'clock in the morning here. Oh, my goodness, Carol. Three o'clock in the morning and you're up. How wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Hello, Carol. <laughs> so that's, uh, she's in Australia, right? I know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> wow, Carol. I'm, I'm lost for words at that three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> So I, I can't remember if it was Carol. So somebody um, uh, emailed me from Australia and said that they were setting their alarm clock so they could get up to watch the interview. And I, 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 I'm I, sorry, I don't remember the name. I might have been Carol. And uh, so thank you so much, Carol. Carol. Yes. Um, I don't know what to say either, because uh, to be honest, <laughs> I wouldn't get up at three o'clock in the morning to watch an interview. <laughs> Well, I stayed with Carol in Hobart and it was pure magic. Thank yeah. you, Carol. Yeah, that's lovely. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So this sketch here, oh my goodness, Pat. Oh. I mean, I love the white against the dark. It just pops so much. And, uh, and was it raining there? No, but it was, it was atmospheric. Mm -hmm. We were on a long yeah. drive to... Uh, from one place to another in Tasmania. I was passed along. I said, like a parcel, but <laughs> lovely friend said, no, no, not like a parcel, like the Olympic torch, which yes. people treasure and carry. And I said, oh, I can live with that. That's nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> this was part of the traveling like the Olympic torch. You, and you are <laughs> the Olympic torch, Pat. Honestly, that's a really good description. That's what you are. I love it. Oh, so we'd had an ice cream. We'd stopped for a yummy ice cream before this. And we wanted to do one last sketch together, Patty Edge and I who I'd been staying with in Launceston, and we were on our way to Devonport, near La Trobe, and we passed this Fitzpatrick's Inn, and oh, yes, with that tree on the left and the white pillars and the sky. No, it wasn't raining, but it had that, that atmosphere, and I was working. I wanted to try this slightly darker blue this time and lift it up with other blues as well, really really enjoyed that yeah it, it's it's just gorgeous I, so i have a question for you yes so i i am dot the all your eyes and cross all your t's kind of person i always probably over sketch um but i'm looking at your tree and i'm thinking okay she didn't do she outlined parts but not all Absolutely, Brenda. Yeah. If I had outlined all of that tree, it would not have had the same energy. Right. Love the tree. You know, when I said last time that I don't do the sky and then put the tree on top. Well, I love that tree and I drew it with my Confucius feud, very juicy black ink and whizzed it in and whizzed the other trees in as well and the dark trees. And then when it was dry, I started outlining to get the feel within the shapes that I'd drawn in black. And I just knew that there were places I had to leave and places I had to carry on with. And similarly, between the shapes of the branches, some of them I've put blue behind from the sky, some of them I've left alone. And you see, these workshops that I was teaching across Australia were all called Less is More. And I've been teaching all the time. I taught five workshops all about what to leave out and what to put in. Yeah. Because what you leave out can be just as important as what you draw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gorgeous, gorgeous sketch. And so Paula is asking, is that toned, is that blue toned paper? Yes, it's a square, a 12 inches square in fact, it might be a little more than 12 inches square, and it's a sort of mid-dark blue, and it had a slight texture to it. I bought several different ones. I I used a dark turquoise in another sketch, 
And this was the first time I'd used a very dark blue. And it was lovely, lovely to work on. So a couple of really great questions here. Uh, Preeti, Preeti is asking, is there an order in which you use your art materials to create each piece of work? Uh, for example, does the fountain pen always go down before the Posca pens? Or to put it another way, do some materials not work well over others? That's a really good question. That's a really good question. I think uh, it's a yes and no here. Quite often, I will start with my fountain pen, my feud pen, and I turn it over to get a fine line from the back of it and a broader line from the front. But I don't draw with that first exclusively because there are times when I might look at a building or a tree in the distance and I don't want it to stand out too much. A lot of artists draw everything with the fountain pen. I draw some, but I will reach for a coloured pencil, maybe like this one, a light blue coloured pencil. And I might have drawn the tops of the trees in light blue and some of the trunks to, to show how they are and the shape of this building because I didn't want it too dark. So I will draw with different things, but I will sometimes I have to be I have to restrain myself. I want to get on with the sketch, but I have to get the bare bones of it, the structure into it. And I will do that in some way, either with a fountain pen, with coloured pencil, or sometimes I often draw with a black Statler Mars Lumograph pencil, a 6B, which is a matte black and lovely for drawing with and for colouring in for tone. And that answers uh, one of the questions up here. Somebody had asked, do you do the first sketches in white pencil? V uh, very occasionally in white pencil, not often. I may more likely use my Mitsubishi white because sometimes I can draw a building in a Mitsubishi white and it's wonderful. Uh, it looks right. It feels right. Something I wouldn't use too early on is are the greasy crayons that I use, the Peter Pauper watercolour crayons, because once you've used those, you can't draw on top of them very easily unless right. you're using a fountain pen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that about those. That they're, yeah. they're, they're kind of greasy. They're, they're like lipstick. <laughs> they're like lipsticks, yeah. And the Posca pens, I rarely use those at the beginning but not because you can't draw on top of them, simply because I know when they go in, they provide real punch and I want to save them and make sure I'm putting them in the right places. Yeah, yeah, cool. And about this uh, one sketch, uh, Jeanette is asking, is the paper smooth or textured? Uh, I would prefer that it was smooth, Jeanette, but these unfortunately had a slight grid ribbed texture which I had to press on at times to get over I prefer a smooth surface in fact um ordinary card from places like Michael's I've forgotten what what it's called in America stock card just ordinary card art, uh, stock. art stock card that's right I like that smooth surface yeah yeah okay cool um, and uh, Pecky is, is saying about the Mitsubishi White, it's a it's a uniball, right? It's a uniball, yes. Yeah. Signal uniball 153, broad. Okay. And I'm going to click to the next sketch. Maureen is asking, Maureen uh, says, I love your use of the negative space for adding titles. Uh, do you plan their placement before beginning the sketch? She says, gorgeous lettering. Thank you. I love putting the lettering on. And the answer to that is a definite no. I don't deliberately leave a space for lettering. Sometimes if it's a very big page like an A3 and I'm doing a, a mixture, a collection of different things, there might be one area that I think, oh, yeah, that would be good for a title. But mostly I just let the picture, the sketch happen and I put the lettering on where it seems to feel right and I balance it up quite often I might put a title at the bottom in a space and above it in a line so that it, it works together putting the date something like that mm -hmm. yeah 
So here's another gorgeous sketch. Um, and it looks like you're, you didn't use too, anything too greasy in this one. <laughs> Not as much, you're right, Brenda. No, this is a very, very soft one. Um, drawn over three mornings because I had time and I was staying here. This beautiful A-frame house that had been in the family since the 1900s. Wow. Early 1900s. And I slept in the opposite room to that one with a balcony looking over the fields. And I sat and drew in the sunlight, very soft colouring because it was so peaceful. Yeah. And it, it was speaking to me about quiet colours and peace and sunlight, but it's morning sunlight. It wasn't the harsh brightness of the Australian sunlight I'd been experiencing before. Mm -hmm. This was a really quiet one, very gentle. Nice. So, you, you know, you really do let the atmosphere of the place impact your art, I, I'm finding. Absolutely, Brenda. To me, a sense of place is what it's all about. Um, it's not about a photographic representation. It's about the feeling of the place. And if I can catch the feeling, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. It's just lovely. <laughs> Um, just, so I'm just, gonna, one, uh, just one mention here. You yeah. know, you're saying about negative space and darks. If you, it's all really gentle, but if you take away the blacks, the the door at the top, the door at the bottom, the little top of the window, the shadows behind this standing stone, the tree and the darkness there, they're what give the precision and the strength to all the gentleness. Punctuation um, darks again. Yeah, we have uh, some lovely questions here for you, Pat. So mm -hmm. Sue, Sue Wary from Queensland is also on this call up at three o'clock in the morning. Oh, well done. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I know. They are more dedicated than me. <laughs> and me. <laughs> good, good for you, Sue. Thank you so much oh, for, you. for being here. So we have two, at least two from Australia. My goodness. Actually, you know, we have someone in the call. I'll tell you, we've got someone here from Singapore. And nice. um, yeah, and uh, and from the Netherlands and uh, and India, a couple ah. of people from India. And so some of these people are up in the middle of the night. Someone from Tasmania is in this call. Thank That's you, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Somebody from New South Wales is in this call. Thank you, everybody, really, for coming. We're, we are, we're really grateful that you're here. So, yeah. Sue, Sue who, <laughs> we better ask Sue's question before she falls asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Sue is asking, um, she, says, Pat, she says, Pat, I would love to see how you would paint our beautiful Great Barrier Reef in your vibrant colors. Whoa. I, doesn't, isn't the Great Barrier Reef underwater? <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen it I've never seen it I don't do many sea paintings to be honest because I don't live all that near to the sea I do love the sea I've done occasional jetties and uh, beachside scenes but I've never done anything like the barrier reef maybe yeah. on another visit <laughs> yeah all right I'm going to just uh, <clears throat> move us along to the next next sketch Gorgeous, gorgeous. Oh my gosh. So Pat, I hope that you're going to do uh, as, uh, I'm sure you will do as beautiful a, of a job sketching uh, our gazebo here in Niagara on the Lake when, oh. you, when you're here in September, as you did on this one. This one is so spectacular. My gosh. Well, you know, Brenda, all the time I was drawing this, I was thinking of Niagara on the lake and the white gazebo there by the lake because I so love that mm -hmm. and I can't wait to draw it. And when I came here and we spent, it was so lovely there, just one or two people wandering. You can see unusually there are people in my sketch. We sat under the shade of trees and this was very, very difficult because unusually, it isn't about shapes against the sky. This time, it was the shape against trees. So this rotunda had was sh against the shadow of all this mass of foliage. Mm -hmm. And you just got the sky further over. And there was such a lot of looking to make it interesting enough, you know, to look into all the trees, all the bushes, all the foliage. 
to try and catch the light in different places to animate it to bring it to life mm -hmm. i i think that th those little dots of color the little dots of blue and there's some little dots of yellow and uh, all around. And I think that really adds so much sparkle. And in closer in the foreground on the bottom left, the little dots of orange that are there, <laughs> it really adds a lot to the sketch. It really just makes it, it brings it to life. It's, it's really just those spots of color that are so lovely. Little dots and things. It's something over the last few years, I've actually begun putting little circles and little spots and dots into my work more and more and sometimes if I have like you can see foliage the two conifers to, um, the left hand side edge they've got blue dots on them I've just done those for fun and for the shadows and as I had the blue pen in my hand I think it was a the blue of the of the title it was one of the blue poscas I just carried on and put dots in different places in the shadows and they can give an impression of trees and sunlight without doing a lot of work and they add some energy yeah i love playing <laughs> it's outstanding just really a lovely outstanding sketch uh and pecky is asking what are your favorite tone paper slash book brands to work oh. on in, in inside and outside a, a sketchbook well uh i've come across I love khaki coloured craft paper and grey. Those are my normal favourites. But since being in Australia, I found a new one. Apart from the colours, I found, and I found this in Melbourne. It's called, it's a Fabriano sketchbook. And it's a kind of craft colour, but it's got a, a greeny golden underlying color to it and it's called sand and i really was sold on that and i'm going to buy another one now i'm home i bought an a3 pad and i use it on my workshops and you'll see some of the sketches with that it's a very unusual very subtle beautiful color um as well as that lately it's a golden yellow Fabriano again, a Tiziano colour, which is a. I did a drawing of beach huts on this colour, and I really am sold on it because it's such a welcoming, glowing colour. Mm -hmm. So, craft grey, the Fabriano sand, and this Tiziano gold, and also. A turquoisey blue, any of the blues like this, I'm, I'm growing to love more and more. Yeah, the, uh, I mean, it's just so spectacular, um, this this sketch. I love it so much. Um, Diane, you. who is with us in Savannah, is on our call, and she says, so delightful to see these and hear your decision-making process. Uh, hugs to you both. Love all the colors. Uh -huh. She says, I noticed the complimentary colors standing out to me. Diane, it's lovely to see you again and sending you a hug back. It was yeah. so good to be with you in Savannah. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, oh my goodness, another one so lovely. And this one has a softness about it uh, where your pencil has picked up the, the uh, tooth of the paper in, in your sky. Yes, yes, yeah. that's where the, um, the grid the texture was actually showing through more. Yeah. But uh, interestingly, if you look to the left, this tree, something that can be quite helpful is if there is an overhanging tree and it's close, if you draw the actual leaves quite carefully in places, it can give, again, a real feeling of being there mm -hmm. because it's very close observation. And depth mm -hmm. as well. And depth, yes, exactly. Yeah. And I, the thing about that's remarkable, that's worth mentioning about this sketch is, um, is you didn't feel obliged to put in a ton of green for all no. of this branch and the trees in the background. No, uh, I'm glad you said that, Brenda. I don't like green as a general rule, which is oh. a ridiculous thing to say. What I've I've actually added more greens this year than I've ever had. But Wait a minute. All... 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That was different. Yes, I've just said I have added more greens, but generally speaking, I don't tend to like greens. So for me to spend three hours on all this foliage was was an amazing breakthrough. Yes. But you know, you you've accomplished your green with the yellow crayon that you used um on the blue. Yes. And it's implied, like it, you know, you didn't really need to put a lot of green. No. Exactly, because it's on turquoise blue. You put yellow over the top and it makes green. But mm. also, I've been using more and more recently, and this is something else to mention about greens. I bought something by Peter Pauper, who made the watercolor crayons, and they're called Bible highlighters. And they are in a pack of four, five, six, seven, eight, in a pack of 10. And they're meant for actually highlighting Bible things for children mm -hmm. quotes and they're like a gel and they're transparent but for trees the blue on top of yellow or craft makes the most glorious subtle olive green and if you use the ochre on top of blue like this one it will give a lovely golden -y green color without being too strong so um, I, I use highlights, highlighters all the time, just, you know, it's an office supply. How, how are these high Bible highlighters different from the regular highlighters that people use as an office supply? Right. Well, they're not at all like them. The usual office supply ones are liquid markers and they're often fluorescent, aren't they? And yeah. you, you stroke them over a word and it highlights the letter. These are like a lipstick, but they're not as greasy. They are like, a, like a, a hard, almost a hard jelly. And you can stroke them and it gives a layer of colour over a colour, but you can still see the colour through. It's like a transparent glaze. And one or two of them are quite fluorescent. The yellow is and the pink is as well. Yeah. But they are an amazing thing. I love them, especially for, for trees. And the trees here... You see the tree under the steeple? Mm -hmm. That green on that tree was a Bible highlighter blue. And the one on the left and the little bit of stroking over the branches, no green. It's a Bible highlighter blue. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah, well, you know them. what? <laughs> People in this call, all almost a hundred of you, <laughs> you must be like Pat and like me. You're like a a, a, a art supply geek. Like everybody wants oh. to know what's that brand? <laughs> Where did you get that? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, Diane is asking, what is the name of the highlighters that we're talking about? They're called uh, Peter Pauper. Oh, the same people who make the watercolor crayons and. It, the, they are Bible Highlighters Studio Series, and you can get them on Amazon. Peter Popper makes the Bible Highlighters. Yes, and the watercolor crayons, yeah. Well, amen to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, uh, so tell us about this sketch, Pat. Right, well, this one, this yellow paper was gifted to me in Hobart because I was moving into yellow and it's brighter than the other. It's just smooth, bright yellow card. And this was a, um, a boathouse jetty sticking out. And it was a blazing hot day and I didn't want to be in the sun. So I went down some stone steps onto the sand and found a little triangle of shade wedged between two stone walls at my back and the shade never moved all the time I drew this which was wonderful wow. and it was it was such fun drawing the sea and the foam and the the patterns of the waves and feeling the sky I really enjoyed it yeah nice I'm sure that would be very relaxing just to hear the water splashing oh, again wow. and Brenda look and look everyone I don't know if you can see it just above where it says Sandy Bay. You see the two birds? Yes. They are traditional hens. They may that may not be the quite quite the right word. Traditional hens, I think they're called. And they were strutting right in front of me. 
backwards and forwards. So just long enough for me to draw them and put them in. So that was a joy. Mm. Super cute. Lovely. <laughs> and wonderful uh, lettering as well, Pat. Your lettering is always outstanding. I love it. Um, and Jeanette is asking, how do you get the smudged effect on the white? Uh, the smudged effect on the white is with a mix of Peter Pauper white watercolour crayon, which gives that smoothness and softness, and it goes over other colours and makes this soft atmospheric feel. And also white coloured pencils and watercolour pencils. You, you go across with diagonals and you get this lovely softness. That yeah. Peter Popper white you're talking about is the one that's like a lipstick. It's kind of greasy. That's right. Yep, yeah, that's right. In fact, I use that so much. I ended up with so many Peter Popper packs and no whites in because I used it like a blender. And yeah. I even wrote to Peter Popper and asked them if they would start stocking and selling just the whites but they said no okay so, so that sorry fun. um the peter popper makes the bible highlighters and but mm -hmm. this this other thing we're talking about is also peter popper but what's it called they're called watercolor crayons oh um, really? again yes watercolor crayon set by peter popper 12 colors available on amazon and again they were for children and they're but they're they're not like a watercolor uh, pencil. They're more like a thick. They're like they're, a, a thick they're a lipstick. They're a really thick, greasy lipstick. Yeah. Yeah, like the the, um, the thickness of your finger. Yes, the thickness of your finger. And I discovered those in Barnes and Noble in Florida when I was there visiting my daughter, and I thought, oh, these are possibles, and I couldn't believe how good they were. Yeah. So Pecky has very kindly um, posted in the Q and A uh, the link for where people can get those Peter Popper watercolor crayons. Now uh, I'm not sure, Pecky, if people can see the comments in the Q and A, and if they can see that, I don't know. Um, thank you anyway for trying that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. So this sketch um, is almost. It reminds me of your garden uh, because <laughs> you've got the lovely gazebo there. Uh, beautiful beautiful thank beautiful. you brenda yeah. this gazebo is bigger than mine mine is much smaller this was a a, a cafe near in golston gorge near golston gorge in outside sydney and it's used for weddings and places like that and it's called the vintage secret garden and it's one of my favorite places you can see catching the atmosphere again it's that sense of peace and softness and yeah. color blending again yeah 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 beautiful and very sparkly yes um, yeah. lots of dots lots of blending yeah white around the edges yeah dark and light again yeah yeah uh, that's what i'm seeing from your art is that it's uh, evolving a bit and there's a lot more color well not necessarily in this one but um a lot more bright colors and a lot more sparkle Yes. Now, the reason, go back to the last one a minute, Brenda, please. Mm -hmm. You go back. This was early on. I had only been in Australia probably for about a week and a half. So my colours were still as they were. But when you yeah. get to the next one, that's one of the new ones. Yeah. yeah. Well, they had you hadn't cooked. The Australians hadn't cooked you long enough yet. No, not then. No, I was still <laughs> gentle. <laughs> still gentle. Ah. Oh. Oh, this was a gorgeous day. Sitting here, you can see I really love this. With Carol, who's here at three o'clock in the morning, we were there drawing this and yeah. the sun was really beating down. And it's that lovely golden yellow Fabriano Tiziano paper. And you're asking about the outlining. That's the blue Posca pen. Because on that colour... It felt to need that. And I even did a double edge of it to make it stronger because it fitted in with this blue beach hut near me. And I added the writing in blue so that it all tied together. Mm -hmm. uh, so Peggy has a good question. Um, they're asking, does it matter to you if these materials are archival and light fast? Uh, 
I suppose the, the main answer to that must be no, because I don't check. All I can say is that I hardly notice any difference with any of my sketches later, whether they're loose on paper or whether they're in sketchbooks. They all seem to stay. I think it's because I use such a mix of materials. You know, you'll get one colour over another. Uh, it doesn't concern me because it doesn't seem to, there doesn't seem to be much fading at all. Mm -hmm. um, and Tina says, I love it when all the memories of that day come in mind when Pat sees the drawing. Yeah, that, uh, that, that happens. That's that, it, that so happens. Whenever I look at a sketch, if I find a pile of sketches somewhere and I go through them, there can be one that's 20 years ago. Yeah. And as soon as I look at it, it's all there. The feeling yeah. of being there, yeah. It's so mm -hmm. true. It's so true. Yeah. And even more so, I think, than a photo because it, with a photo, you just snap a quick snap and then you run off to the next thing. And But, you know, yeah. when you're sitting there for an hour and a half, you're really building oh, yeah. a memory with the place. Yes, absolutely. Once you've drawn it, you've interacted with it and it's spoken to you and it's in your heart. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Pat, <laughs> so gorgeous. I love your flowers. Uh, I, I realize now that the way you do flowers, there's another sketch that you did a few years ago um, that uh, you showed oh, me. Oh, the bouquet. That's your favorite, isn't it's it? It's my favorite. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. Your flowers are so spectacular, so lovely. Um, and Preeti is asking, how long does it take you to complete one of these sketches? Well, this one was on my last day in Blackheath. And I only had, I think I only had an hour. I was lucky to, to even have that. And I did a little bit more when I got to my next port of call. So mm, two hours max. Yeah. Um, I think actually the original of that is slightly richer. It looks a little bit uh, more quiet than it than it would be. But those agapanthus were huge, huge. But I wanted to get the background in, the trees right at the back as well. Yeah, beautiful. Just just beautiful. And so much life um, because it's it's I know you it is you are controlled in your sketching, you know exactly what you're doing, but it has a feeling of, you know, the wildness of nature because of the, of the, the, the marks are just going off all in different directions and so on. So that's such an important uh, um, observation, Brenda, because I think, yes, when we draw something living, we have to feel the life in what we're drawing, mm -hmm. whether it's trees or bushes or grass, or flowers and if you feel if you if you're too precise then all that life can vanish but if you let your your hands dance around the page and just move from one thing to another and feel and press on in places and leave off and have a really light touch in places and then press on hard all of that gives energy and feeling the mark making and the line, quality of line, is crucial. And I think, you know, precision, in especially in an organic scene like this one, uh, where there's only like a little bit of man-made objects in it, um, is, is a photograph, a photograph that captures a moment in time when that, that plant was sitting exactly in that spot. Mm -hmm. But in real life, these plants would be moving in the wind slightly, yeah and so on and so you really don't want a lot of precision maybe uh, in places if it was all really loose it would lack something there will, there's a need to put precision in in certain places to hold it together if you look at the foreground the few flowers right at the front you can see where the pond uh the light of the pond is showing through the shapes of the grasses mm -hmm. and the shape of the flowers and the, the the roundness of the flowers is drawn quite carefully, although it's free in places. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kate is asking, uh, do, do these lipstick, uh, lip, lipstick-esque crayons smudge uh, onto the opposing page of your sketchbook? Never, ever. 
yeah interestingly never ever and i use them all dry but they are they have been developed to be used as watercolor crayons you can add water to them but i don't yeah yeah ah. um and linda uh, is asking can you address your pro process of inputting your drawings into procreate to complete and what aspects are you doing in procreate so so uh, i don't know if there's an example but uh, how much of the sketch is procreate there will be one probably later on okay. um it depends where i stop when i'm usually i only go into procreate and add a little bit sometimes even just the lettering if i want to try with some lettering and think well i don't want i may not want to put it here i might try it in, in procreate but yeah. well you can talk about it when the next when the one comes that, up yeah. but yeah. yeah so so just so that people know pecky has been very kind to put up the links for the um peter popper watercolor crayons and also for the a Peter Popper um, Bible gel highlighters. And so that you can see that in the Q&A box, but I, I can see that some people can't see the Q&A box. And I apologize if you can't see it, I don't know. But I'll leave those links up there for a bit if, if people wanna click on it or write it down um, so that they can um, see that. Okay. So this sketch here, uh, we're, now we're onto a man-made uh, subject and uh, lovely lovely the lettering really adds so much as always and uh just beautiful <laughs> it's, it's interesting because when i was drawing this this is uh in molden in victoria in australia and it was i we i decided I, we decided with with kate that we would i would use this as the focus for the second day of my workshop in Malden because it was such an interesting building. And this, the main street is full of these buildings. And we were sitting in the doorway of a gallery. I was in the shade to protect myself, myself and Kate was in the sun because she wanted to keep warm. <laughs> but uh, the thing was, these buildings, all the time I was drawing them, I kept thinking, these are like Niagara-on-the-Lake sure these are like Niagara on the lake and they look to have that same um timelessness about them because Malden was a, a gold mining town yeah. I never, yeah <laughs> I know them. <laughs> well I can tell you they're not really like Niagara on the lake Pat, yeah. because well <laughs> <laughs> this this has a feeling of like the old west um you know uh, like a western town in the United States with the tin roof and yeah. um, Niagara on the Lake is more upscale than that it's a it's a very uh, upscale it has oh. a beautiful older buildings but they're all really um, really kept up and the neighborhood it's a very expensive um, neighborhood around there so no <laughs> uh, I think I think the thing is about Malden here that they actually play up or heighten the vintage feel of it all yeah. because it's very much um, a tourist community place and the hardware stores will have stuff outside like they might have looked in the 1950 in the 1850s you know so it's all part of its charm but yeah. that's me Linda that's just how I felt drawing it I thought oh I'm going to be drawing something like this obviously not quite the same <laughs> no it's it's yeah. really a lot more upscale <laughs> right thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> that's okay uh this is really lovely um I mean I I just love it I think it's fantastic I love the old rusty tin roof uh, over oh no you see that was such fun yeah and um, again it's the heightening and the close looking you think about the less is more which is what I was teaching if you look at the tin roof, I haven't done it all. I've left a lot of spaces, yeah. but I've used the negative space. Look at the little spots along the edge of the tin, which shows that it's tin. Yeah. And the negative spaces in the trees at the back yeah. and here in the windows and in between there. All these punctuation of darks make a difference. And I've left underneath the veranda the overhang that could have been very dark but i didn't want it to dominate so i just did it very gently and a little aside if you look at the trees at the top that green of the trees 
is the Bible highlighter blue again. I've been using it more and more. It's magic. Wow. So that's the blue on, on this craft um, paper comes out as sort of dusty green. Yep. Wow. Interesting. Yes. yes. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Um. So uh, Preeti is just mentioning, um, Brenda, you might uh, have to mark a question as answered in live in order for us to see it. Just a suggestion. Yeah. Preeti, I have been, I have been marking them answered live. And, um, and because I have to, um, I, I do have to kind of delete them off the screen so that I can see the ones that come below that. Otherwise I can't see them. So I'm not sure what to say, uh, my friend. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what, you know how to make it so that you can see them. I think there's a setting, uh, Q&A setting to, and, uh, and uh, so I don't know why some people can see them and other people can't. Sorry, I'm sorry. I don't know. Don't know the answer to that question. All right, let's move on to your next sketch. And there we go. Oh my gosh, Pat. Uh, so well, colorful, so wonderful. Now, this is one of the first of the Eureka Australia is hot moments. And this was one I do have somewhere a, um, a photograph of this as it was before I worked on it. This is a combination of on the spot and procreate. And it was one of the hottest days of all in Australia. And I was sitting and a local cafe owner actually brought me out um, a glass of water, iced water, so that I didn't get dehydrated when I was drawing. And I wasn't even going in his cafe, which was wow. lovely. Yeah. So lovely. So warm. I know. Good man. And yeah. you can see the glow. This is the feeling I wanted. It was so hot, really bouncing off the pavements. And wow. that glow I wanted in the trees. I wanted in the, in the facade there. But again, the less is more. Look at this facade on the left. Big area just left alone. Mm -hmm. The colour of the background and the red little bits and pieces of bricks and a lot left alone the sky reflected in the windows some of these white bricks drawn in different ways and some left and dots so so beautiful and um such saturated color so so intense really beautiful well the actual zing of the color was procreate oh really and Yes, I drew it on paper and I'd intended this one because I hadn't realised I was changing. I'd intended it to be almost monochromatic on this golden background in black and white and maybe pale blue and a mid blue. That's what I envisaged. And suddenly I imported it and uh, vroom, everything happened and it yeah. worked from then. <laughs> Gina says so inspiring Pat and oh. you are you're very inspiring and she's such a wonderful teacher um just oh. really inspired everyone Pat and I were together at a workshop uh, in um in Savannah Georgia as well as well as with our friend Diana and there might be other people on the call here but I, I can't uh, tell but um <laughs> Pad was an amazing teacher. We had bad weather, unfortunately, for two days. And Pat, like a magician, like the <laughs> leprechaun that she is, <laughs> she pulled um, two classes, two whole workshops right out of her hat, right out of thin air. And they were so valuable. Like, it's not like, you know, oh, it was a lesser class. No, it was, uh, I learned a lot. I think everybody else did as well. Um, she just did a fantastic job and I can't sing Pat's praises enough as a teacher because I mean I think sometimes you look at people and they you know they their, their sketches are wonderful but they don't really want to share the real secrets of how they do things they kind of want to keep it a mystery so no one will copy them but Pat gives you the whole thing and she shares all her secrets and that's what I really love about you Pat. Oh thank you thank you Tina and oh. I'm, I'm lost for words. Thank you. 
Uh, I have, I think there's a question here about your, about this sketch. It says, is the blue, bright blue sky Posca pen or Procreate? It's a mix of both. It's a mix of both. I started it with a Posca pen and I carried on in Procreate because you can get almost the same color. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. We'll go to the next sketch. Oh, we saw this one. You did? Yeah. Well, okay, what sorry. It's, it's there twice. I apologize. Oh, where is it? Oh. Okay. Uh -huh. well, Lots of... Uh, this one is all about patterns, almost. Well, this is the teeniest little sketch. It's oh. probably ooh, about five inches square, that's all. Yeah. Five or six inches square, which is rare for me. And it was the second day of my workshop in Blackheath. And we went into town. We drove into town and sat under the shade of the veranda again. And opposite us was this stripy building. And would you believe it was a public toilet? <laughs> and it was all these amazing um, zigzaggy colours and patterns. And I was just so inspired. Mm -hmm. And uh, You didn't have to tell us that part, Pat. I know I didn't, but I had to do <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it interesting how the lines uh, that, that are outlining the trees and the those zigzaggy stripes are just kind of connected and pop yes. out at you? This is the balance thing again. If you've got something in your hand, where else can it go? Yeah. And if you take the lettering off, the lettering adds another little square of a fine line pattern almost, yeah. which links with the trees. Yeah. And the little bits of dots or bits of white lower down, every little bit balances up. Like the turquoise in the roof yes. of the building, if you move across, there's turquoise in the tree, a few dots and holes, and in the roof. They may not have been there, but I might have just said, oh, yes, we need a bit of turquoise over there, and plopped it in. And I mean, I think you, I know you are an artist and an urban sketcher, and as an urban sketcher, uh, we try to capture uh, a moment in time, a certain place and moment in time and be faithful to what we see. But we're yeah. also able to embellish and to translate into our own language of art and so on. And uh, and I, I see that that's what you do as well. Absolutely, Brenda. I mean, you say be faithful to what we see. And I know people have said to me from time to time, Pat, I wish I could see with your eyes. <laughs> I do. I look at a sky and if I look really hard, I can see underlying uh, hints of pink or yellow. And then I put them in and that heightens the sky. And yeah. it's the same thing with trees and shadows. I look into shadows and they're not just black. I can see a lot of blues in there, sometimes purples. And it's looking hard. And being heightening what you see, but being true to your own vision. Yeah, yeah, it is, it's so true. So great. Um, a couple of questions here. Well, Diane, who was with us in Savannah, is coming with us again to Niagara and the Lake. I'm so excited, oh. Diane. I really oh. enjoyed your company. You oh. were so lovely and just so wonderful to be with and that we get to hang out with you again in Niagara and the Lake. That is going to be super fun. See really you in happy. September, Diane. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And Angie is, says, she, uh, she says, hi, this is Angie from Berlin, Germany. Thank you so much, Brenda, for this fantastic interview with Pat. I'm in love with the wisdom and knowledge she shares. Me too. Oh, how wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh. I think there's a lot of people on this call. I feel the same way. And oh. uh, Preeti says, so many different color combinations and all simply gorgeous. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Diane says, Pat, the Black Heath 12th of February sketch, uh, this one, I guess it is, yeah. uh, reminds me very much of Aboriginal art. Oh, yes, it does. That I saw, it's the contemporary, I asked about this, and they said, it's a contemporary take on Aboriginal art. Ah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I love the patterns that I saw in so many places. And one of the places with the most patterns was Melbourne, almost yeah. on every street corner. Yes. Really? Mm, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. 
Oh my goodness, Pat, 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 what am I going to do with you? <laughs> oh, thanks. Oh. oh my gosh. You know, it takes your breath away, really. I'm, I'm usually pretty quick with a question or, you know, an observation, but sometimes I just, I, I click on to the next sketch and then I just have to sit and stare at it for a while because it's so, you know, no. unexpected. It's so brilliant. It's, uh, you know, it's so eye-catching. Um, oh my gosh, really lovely. How long did it take you to do this one? uh well actually on the spot I only it was the last day the second day and we decided of my workshop in Sydney and we were on a main street where it was really busy and we were almost blocking the pavement so we had to be very careful and we none of us managed to to finish this one so I had to finish it back at home but it was in that sketchbook again with two coloured papers and one side of the page was purple and this was one of the first sketches I think this one was the one after the golden one where I got the drink of water from the cafe owner mm -hmm. this was the next one and suddenly whoa it was all happening the purple really sang to me and the buildings were red brick facades. And I left the other buildings purple because I felt it needed heightening. I just played with what I saw yeah. and played with the feel. And that, um, the, the pointed turret was a gift because it was like jewels with yeah. gold and yellows and blues and reds, just gorgeous. Mm. So if people are watching this and they're thinking, oh, man, I would love to try that. But, um, you know, you, you go to the store and they're, they're buying colored papers and they come home and, and you go out to sketch somewhere and you pull out a purple paper like this. Um, that, you know, I, I can easily imagine that people might look at the purple paper and look at the scene in front of them and go, I, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, let me suggest one thing that I would suggest you do if you're trying a colour for the first time. And we did this in my final workshop in La Trobe when I, I laid out all the colours that I've been buying for myself to bring home and said to everybody, come on, choose one and try a colour and see what you can do with it. And that meant there were a lot of us and they were all using different colours, blues and reds and oranges and purples and they were all testing out. I taught them how to work on top of different colours, put colours underneath, layer them and see what could happen. And the the results were incredible. I was really, really thrilled. And on here, you can see it happening. I've used, you see the purple of the back building? Yeah. It's brighter in the centre. Now, I used a, um, a Peter Pauper purple for that because it's greasy and it's bright yeah. and I pressed on hard and it made that beautiful glowing purple and I added it to the left of the building and behind the lettering yeah. and this red facade of the pointer building behind the minaret that's a mixture of reds some of them are red peter purple which is very bright and red and greasy some of it is posca red you know yeah. you have to press on at times and just play with it, but have a piece of paper, the same colour next to you. This is my tip. Have your main paper that you're going to draw on. Have another piece of paper next to you, smaller one, and test your colours. Play with them. Press on heavily. Press on lightly. Put yeah. one colour over another. See what happens. Yeah. I think that that whole idea of just playing and not taking it all so seriously is really yeah. important. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, you're making art. And so if we take ourselves too, too seriously and we have, you know, unreasonable expectations of ourselves and we, we just take it all so seriously, first of all, you're not going to have fun. And, uh, and that's no. important. Life is short. You've got to have fun. Oh, um, you have to have fun. Yeah. You have to enjoy it. You have to love it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is our last uh, sketch, and uh, so we can turn our cameras back on. Um, 
Pat. Yep. And, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this lovely, lovely interview. I really appreciate it. And I think a lot of people on this call really did as well. I mean, I learn a lot when I do these interviews. I know the viewers do as well. And, you know, we, I've got my little list here of all my things, all the different materials that she was using, the Hobines and the Poskas and the Mitsubishis. I was writing it all down. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you so much, Pat, for, for this uh, generous interview and, and sharing with us your gorgeous art. Um, just so that people know, next week on April the 27th, uh, we'll be hosting a free demo with Kosha Kuna, the co-founder of Sketchbook School. And she's going to be sketching a scene inspired by her upcoming vacation workshop uh, for sketchers in Malta in November. And so to get your free ticket to that demo, you, you do the same as what you did for this. Go to www.studio56boutique.com and click on the pull down menu called free stuff. And there you can get your free ticket to her free demo. And also, Pat's upcoming vacation workshop in Niagara-on-the-Lake. We would love it if you guys would join us and just share in the joy of the gorgeous art that Pat has to make and to teach. And uh, we have tickets available. We'd love it if you join us. It's, it's a lovely, lovely little town. We're going to visit Niagara Falls, if you've never been there. One of the seven wonders of the world, I think. And um, we're going to go to a winery. We're going to watch a live play. And it's a very walkable town. Very walkable, easy to get around. It's right on the lake. We're going to go to Fort George. We're going to stare across the water at the Americans and wave. You can see them. <laughs> it's true. It's, you can see them just across the Niagara River. Hello, Americans over there. Uh, so that's kind of fun. And uh, so we have tickets available for Pat's uh, workshop in Niagara on the Lake, although our registration is closing soon. So if you are interested, you need to make your deposit uh, for her, her workshop. And also coming up, I have another workshop in Florence in September, Florence, Italy with Hazel Sohn. Hugo Costa is going to be teaching a workshop in Rome in September. David Morales will be teaching one in Granada, Spain in October. Kosha Kuna is going to be in Malta in November. I've got lots coming up. Stephanie Bauer is going to be in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico in February. And Brian Jernigan, who's an abstract acrylic painter. It's going to be the first abstract, abstract workshop that I've ever uh, organized. And she, he's going to also be in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico in February. And finally, Alex Hilkertz will be in Provence in April next year, 2024. So those, you can find out more information about all of those on the website. Uh, comments, Ruth says, thanks so much for this fascinating interview. And thank you, Ruth, for coming out to play today and hanging out with us. And Cindy says, thank you so much, Pat and Brenda. This was just great. So inspiring to open up and play and be creative and not afraid of color. Amen, sister, you are right. Vicky says, thank you so much. She says, I'm just reading comments. She says, there's so many composition tips too that can be used with every medium. I'm going to be out seeing differently after this. Many thanks. And um, and I and uh, Marion says, thank you so much, ladies. I love it. Thank you so much to Brenda for hosting this wonderful show and tell with Pat. One of these days, I hope to attend a workshop by Pat. And I hope you will too, because you will never forget it. It's unbelievable. She's so great. Can I can I say thank you? Thank you, Brenda, and thank you all of you. You've been wonderful through all of this. You've really touched me here. And as far as Niagara goes, I'm thinking back to Savannah, where we went in November. And I know some of you here were in Savannah with me, and it was pure magic. And to get that feeling back again, um, in September I've never been to Canada and I can't wait and it'll just be lovely I do hope some of you can come yeah it would be great mm -hmm. and so if uh, also if you go to the studio 56 for creatives a uh, YouTube channel uh, Pat has some other free demos uh, she has a free demo and a several mm -hmm. interviews there um, and so if you want more Pat you'll find it at the studio 56 for creatives YouTube channel well, thank you, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you, Pat. You know I love you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Sending hugs. Take care, everybody. Everyone. Bye. All right. Have a great day.
Bye for now.